Hi, this is Misha, and in this video we're going to get into the history of the Arsenal AK in the USA. And by that, I don't necessarily mean Arsenal Incorporated out of Las Vegas, although that will be the predominant part of this video. I mean the Bulgarian Arsenal AK, both milled and stamped, trying to give kind of a comprehensive history, because the early days especially are very... Um, interesting and confusing now i don't with the cost of arsenal guns especially when the first ones came out i wasn't in a position to buy them so we'll flash up some pictures luckily i've at least been able to handle pretty much all the guns i'm going to talk about today so i'll go a little bit off memory and if i get something wrong apologies but you know kind of representing the earliest guns here to get started we have an arsenal usa SSR 99P. This is a very early gun from the late 90s, early, early 2000s. We have a current import Arsenal SAM 7R. This is standing in for the SLR 101, which was the first import by Arsenal Incorporated, Las Vegas, Nevada. So just pretend like this is an SLR 101 and we'll get into why that's pretty easy to do in a little bit. And finally on the table, we have an Arsenal Incorporated SAS M7 Classic. Now note there is a space SAS space M and then there's a dash 7 Classic that will become important later. This is another product from Arsenal Incorporated, but it's different from the SLR 101 in one key area. And we'll get to that in a bit too. And then we'll move on from there. The first Bulgarian Arsenals to come into the United States were the SA 93s. SA standing for semi-automatic, 93 for the year 1993 in which they were designed. Now, communism fell in Europe between 1989 and 1991, depending on which nation. Up until the point when the SA-93 came in, we had not really received a Kalashnikov-type gun from deep within the former Warsaw Pact Eastern Europe Comblock. We had received AKs before, but from places like China, Yugoslavia, and to some extent Hungary even fits into the same kind of um, idea. These countries were friendly with Soviet Russia, but they were not under strong Soviet domination and control. Hungary of the three probably being the most, but even it being next to Austria and further into Europe was less so towards the end. Bulgaria, however, was very much a uh, Soviet client state, as was, for example, Romania. So the SA-93 coming over was really the first gun to come over from that part of Europe with the classic style. Now, though it was designed in 93, and though a lot of websites will report that it was imported starting in 93, most of the Trunnion dates I've seen, actually all of them, that I've seen in person were 95 dated. But let's say they started coming in in 94, just, you know, in that era. It usually takes a little time, you know, to get a, get a model over, get it approved. The SA-93 was unique. It had a milled receiver. And the only companies to really import milled receiver Kalashnikovs up to that point were Mitchells with the Yugoslavian guns in very small numbers. Some of theirs were milled, mostly in the larger calibers like the uh, M76. We also had the Finnish guns from Valmet, which they had done both stamped and milled. And of course, most famously, and in the largest numbers, the Chinese guns, beginning with the, the Polytech Legends, running through the milled Mac 90s, which were coming in around 93 as well. So most of the AKs on the market, for example, the Steyr Mahdi's, and the Hungarian SA-85Ms were stamped. So the SA-93 made at Arsenal AD, which was the post-communist name of the Circle 10 factory, was unique in that sense. Unfortunately, it came in well after the 1989 Bush 
executive order banning the importation of so-called assault rifles. So it came in with a thumbhole stock, a non-threaded barrel, no bayonet lug, and for some reason no cleaning rod. And not only did it not have a cleaning rod, it couldn't accept one. They actually took the, the spots to take the cleaning rod out of the front sight and the gas block and even the handguard retainer didn't have a hole for it. I always thought that was odd. I guess they were just covering their bases. Also, the front sight was not was not drilled for the uh, for the plunger to retain a muzzle device. Finally, another alteration. A milled receiver has two tangs, a top with one screw and a bottom with two. The SA-93 lacked the bottom tang because of the thumbhole stock. So instead of being held in by three screws on the stock, it was held in with the pistol grip screw and the top tang screw, which was plenty secure. It would come in with wood stocks. They would have kind of a brown shellac or paint on them, but they were Bulgarian wood. It would be basically an AK Type 3. It would have a ported gas tube. It would use a 16 inch AK medium heavy profile barrel. The barrel would be pressed and pinned into the receiver, not screwed, which is what Bulgaria had been doing. They, they stuck with the milled receiver, whereas everyone else switched to stamped. The broad strokes, it was a lot like a traditional Soviet AK, but of course it had other modern updates as a, in addition to the press barrel. For example, the dust cover latch was the modern style. The, um, the magazine latch was the modern style, stamped with a rib in it, not the original milled. So small things, but still a very high quality gun. A lot of people claim the SA-93 is the best thing to ever come in. I'm not sure I would go that far. I've held several. They were good, but they weren't really much better than a lot of later offerings. But they were definitely a very high quality Kalashnikov to come in in the mid-90s from Bulgaria in the first. They were brought over primarily by Dominion. They were also brought over in smaller numbers by Dunev and Sentinel. And later, Dominion would partner with Intric, making Intric Dominion once the, uh, the owner of Dominion would, uh, would pass away unexpectedly. So we had uh, four importers, really three, and then you know a later version that would bring in the SA-93. But it would only come in for a very brief period of time, a couple of years. It would soon be replaced by the next model, the SLR-95. Now, the SA-93 was Arsenal Circle 10, Arsenal AD's first attempt at a semi-automatic rifle. Again, communism was just falling. They were learning how to get into the, um, to the market. So they split the line up, their, their civilian line. Instead of doing the SA series, they did two. They did the SAR series, which was essentially just like their military guns, but in semi-auto. And then they did the S. LR series, which were more dedicated sporting guns. Now the SAR series was never importable into the USA. Many attribute this to the 1994 assault weapons ban. This is incorrect. The assault weapons ban had nothing to do with import. This still harkens back to the 1989 executive order. So the SARs were never importable here with their features. That said, they have been sold in Europe ever since, so you can find them in some European nations. We instead received the SLR series, beginning with the SLR-95, as I said. This rifle was very similar to the SA-93, but whereas the SA-93 was based on the original AK Type 3 with the slightly heavier profile barrel, the 45 degree gas block, and so on, the SLR-95 was based on Arsenal AD's then current AR-M1 rifle, which was something they were both trying to sell to the Bulgarian military and for foreign export. Arsenal has been and continues to be to this day a very major exporter of Kalashnikovs, most recently to the Middle East. The ARM-1 is an interesting hybrid of the AK-74 in the original AK, in a lot of ways kind of skipping right over the AKM. It uses the milled receiver and tang system from the original gun, but then instead of having the heavier profile barrel, we have the lighter profile of the AK-74 complete with its 90 degree gas block. And some AR M1s also have the AK-74 front sight with 
the 24 millimeter threads and the bayonet lug underneath. So it was a more modern gun. Also, the uh, the ARM1 had and still has today, I should say, black polymer furniture instead of wood. So the SLR95 was basically receiving the same treatment as the SA93 had. We had a thumb hole stock. We had the new ARM1 profile barrel. We did not have a barrel thread. We did not have bayonet lugs. We didn't have a cleaning rod still. We didn't have a rear sling swivel. That was another thing the SA93 was missing. Although some of the SLR95 stocks would have the swivel on them, but not on the receiver. This would be a very good success for Arsenal. They were priced fairly. They're a little higher than, say, the, the other guns of the era. Remember, this is right when the Chinese imports were ending. They would have a lot of the same restrictions as converting them over. Again, the lower tang is removed. Now, one thing to note, the SA-93 and the SLR-95 still accepted high-capacity magazines. In the mid-90s, this was still allowed for an import because it wasn't one of the features that was banned in the 89 executive order. There was also a short-lived version that only a few came in called the SLR-96. And really, the SLR-96 was just a remarked SA-93. It had still had the, uh, the AK Type 3 profile barrel and the 45-degree gas block. So, and it had wood furniture, too. So, interesting, but not very many of those are out there. These guns would primarily come in through Dominion Investment. And that's the only importer I've confirmed. There might have been a few others, probably were. In these early days, you, the importers were very fluid. You also see this with the Romanian early guns that started to come in in 97, which we have a separate video on. Either way, they would bring them in beginning at least around 96. I have not found any that were confirmed to be in 95, but they were definitely bringing them in 96, possibly 95. And they brought them in until 1998 when again American law gets in the way. Now in 98 the federal assault weapons ban is still going strong and at the very end of 1997 the US Treasury Department along with the ATF put a suspension on granting further import licenses. They wanted to review the, uh, the standards of what defines sporting. The 1989 Bush ban tied itself to the 1968 Gun Control Act, which said that guns could only be imported if they had a sporting per uh, purpose. So they reviewed it and they said in 98, hey, high capacity magazines aren't sporting. We're no longer going to start letting guns come in with high capacity mags. They can't take high capacity mags. And by they define high capacity by 10 rounds. It's an arbitrary number, but there you go. So, in 98, the importation of the SLR-95, SLR-96 ended because they couldn't get more import permits. The ones already here, of course, were legal. Now, that brings us to this critter here. This is the SSR-99P. It was sold by... Arsenal USA Global Trades not the arsenal you're thinking of different arsenal as I said the importation early on was pretty erratic a company Global Trades incorporated under the name Arsenal USA in 1998 they were out of Houston Texas I've seen some reports say Galveston, but looking at public records, they were officially incorporated in Houston, although they might have had an office in Galveston, I don't know. I've been there, it's close to the ocean. I wouldn't want to have a gun company next to the ocean. Saltwater, anyway. The idea they wanted to do, before they were officially incorporated in 98, they started talking in 97 about bringing over a new model of rifle from Bulgaria. They wanted to bring over what became known as the SLR-100. Now, whereas the SLR-95 and the SLR-96, brought over by Dominion, were in 7.6239, the new SLR-100 was going to be in 5.56. At the time, Arsenal AD in Bulgaria was helping the country try to join the Western world, both um, 
NATO and the newly forming EU and so on and so forth. So they were pushing for the 556 caliber and they were obviously getting very far away from 545. They were going to do a version of the SLR 95 and the new caliber, the new small caliber, and it would look pretty much the same. Thumb hole stock, it would take high capacity magazines, double stack, I should say, you know, polymer furniture. But then the 98 ruling came through and that put a kibosh to the SLR 100. Well, after some deliberation, kind of figuring out what they could do, they had invested a lot of time and energy over at Arsenal USA Global Trades. They discovered they could bring over receivers. There was nothing wrong with bringing over SLR 100 receivers. So, instead of bringing over complete guns, Arsenal USA was one of the first to start up the whole kit building thing for AKs. They would import receivers out of Bulgaria along with basically complete AR M1 parts kits. They would bring them over to the USA and assemble them here. They would use four to five parts, really they only needed four since they did not have a removable muzzle device. They would go with an American made trigger group, American made pistol grip, and that was really four. Sometimes they would also have an American made muzzle device. Obviously they would have to shave off bayonet lugs. The first company that Arsenal USA contracted with to do their builds was Gordon Tech, at the time owned by Jerry Gordon. And this gun was built by Gordon Tech. And the first project was called the SSR 99. Now I don't have one of those, but we'll flash up a picture. It was basically an AR M1 clone assembled in the USA from mostly Bulgarian parts in 76239. There was another version chambered for 5.56 called the K101, K101. So these two guns would be built from all new unissued Bulgarian parts, first by Gordon Tech, later by Arsenal USA in-house. Gordon Tech and Arsenal USA had a falling out pretty early on after Gordon Tech had only built a, uh, a couple of uh, hundred rifles. Another version that Gordon Tech was building beginning around 1999 and around 2000 was this one here. The SSR 99P differed from the SSR 99 in that it was built from a surplus Polish KBG 1960 parts kit, which was an original AK Type 3 made in Poland with grenade launching capability. And Gordon Tech would build these on the same SLR, SLR 100. <laughs> Bulgarian receivers. So it's very similar to the original Polish except instead of having the screw-in barrel because these are more modern receivers it has a pressed and pinned in barrel. The rest of the parts are uh, the original Polish. Gordon Tech would build fewer than 500 of these. Some for Arsenal USA, some for itself. As for the original SSR 99 between the two people who put them together fewer than 300 around 250, 260 were made and the K101, fewer than 200, probably around 150, 120 to 150 were made. So very small production numbers. Well, Arsenal USA Global Trades would have a falling out, not only with Gordon Tech, but also with Arsenal AD in Bulgaria. So after bringing over SLR 100 and also receivers marked SLR 100H, which we'll get to in a second, receivers, they would stop bringing over milled Bulgarian receivers and parts and switch over to doing US kit builds using stamped receivers. You're going to find quite a few Arsenal USA kit builds on stamped receivers. These will vary and we're not gonna get them today because they're not really Bulgarian. If they are, it's just the Bulgarian parts kits. It is worth noting that Arsenal USA changed its name to Armory USA in 2004 and then went out of business around 2008-2009. They were the tooling and everything to build stuff was bought out by uh, Hector Bennett of uh, Elk River Tool and Die who is still in business today and actually has contracted quite a bit with Century. But that's getting outside of the scope of this video. There's also the SSR 85 series, which many of you will mention. 
These again were basically kit builds, what they would do. Arsenal USA, Armory USA, Global Trades would purchase Hungarian, Polish, and even some Bulgarian kits, and they would have them assembled in Bulgaria on tooling that they provided for stamped receivers and then imported. So they are imported guns, but they're not factory new guns and they weren't done by Arsenal AD. So that again gets kind of out of the scope, but I wanted to mention it before it gets, uh, gets brought up here. So if you see an SSR-99, the original with black furniture, know that it is built from Bulgarian parts, but assembled in the USA. It would be really the first Bulgarian gun to feature a true pistol grip. It would be able to take high capacity at the time pre man mags, although it would ship with a small one like this. And it would have various muzzle devices pinned on. Sometimes a slant, sometimes a nut, sometimes an AK-74 type. And again, the SSR 99P is what I'm holding here, built from Polish stuff. So that's pretty much the end of Arsenal USA's involvement in Bulgarian imports. They brought over some receivers for a while, contracted some builds, did a few builds in-house. After Arsenal USA got away from the SLR 100 receiver, though, we had another company come in. Intric, who had done the SLR 95 along with Dominion in the late 90s started to bring in the receivers and they would contract with four companies to do 600 guns each as a test batch. They had a bunch of these uh, Bulgarian milled receivers. They also had a bunch of Hungarian AK-55 which was just a licensed copy of the uh, Russian Type 3 parts kits. So they sent kits and receivers to four companies. We have Gordon Tech, Blue Ridge, MSC, and Ohio Ordnance. And they each had build 600, and they picked the best. The ultimate winner was Gordon Tech. There's different claims as to why they won the contract over Blue Ridge. Those two seem to be the two main competitors, and those are the ones you find today. It's worth noting that both kept on making guns regardless. Blue Ridge still made another, you know, uh, thousand more mill guns, just not under the Intric contract. So you're going to see SLR 100 and SLR 100H marked receivers built with Hungarian parts kits. Now these kits, unlike these Polish, range from very nice condition to fair condition at best. A lot, a lot of people have reported worn out bores. Other people report mint bores. Either way, Gordon Tech, who had done the SLR, excuse me, the SSR 99 project for Arsenal USA, took on the SLR 100 project for Intric. I do not know how many they made after that first batch, but a few. It seems like they offered them up until about 2001, 2002, with the SLR project getting started around 2000. These guns would be full featured using all original kits, some matching, some not. They would just shave off the uh, bayonet fangs here on the front sight base to make them legal during the assault weapons ban. And they would have a threaded barrel with a spot weld holding on a slant muzzle brake usually, sometimes a muzzle nut. There's a few different varieties. You'll see some with a parked finish, some with kind of a baked finish, some with a blued finish. Most either had the rear sling swivel on the butt stock, which was added. Now this is a Polish stock and I have seen original Polish stocks with the rear sw swivel on them, but they lack the swivel point on the back of the receiver. That's just not what they did in Bulgaria because the original ARM1 had the swivel on its stock. So no swivel here. So sometimes you'll find an SLR100 without it. Blue Ridge did something interesting too they would take the barrel pin, weld it up, and grind it flush. So a lot of people think that the, some of the Blue Ridge guns actually have a threaded in barrel. They don't, but they've hidden the barrel pin very well to replicate the look of a threaded barrel, which I thought was really a neat idea. It's also worth noting that a lot of the Blue Ridge guns weren't necessarily marked. They used several markings. As I said, even after the contract went to Gordon Tech, they would continue to build some. 
Even more confusing though, Intric would sell just stripped SLR 100 receivers and people would buy these and build accordingly. Some in garages to very poor results, some by very professional companies like Vector. You'll also find that Blue Ridge would, do, would sell barreled actions and they did a run of guns for classic firearms back in the day too. So there's a lot of variation. At the end of the, excuse me, at the end of the day, the point to take home, not all SLR 100s are created equal. Good Bulgarian receivers, but the quality of the kits put on them varies. And they're used parts kits. All right, so that knocks that out of the way. We're, we're up to about 2002. Uh, Intric is getting out of the business too, bringing over the receivers, and uh, Arsenal USA is into building its guns here from parts kits. So, now we can finally talk about the main event. Arsenal Incorporated Las Vegas, Nevada. As most know, Arsenal Incorporated is the importer of Bulgarian guns and has been selling Bulgarian guns for quite some time. I guess you could say they kind of won the uh, the wars to bring the Bulgarian guns in and, and deal with Bulgaria. The company was incorporated in 1999 and it was the first US company to really be officially approved by Arsenal AD Circle 10. They allowed them to use their logo, their name, they gave them tooling, support, training. Basically they treated them like a sister company. They, they allowed this. The first gun that Arsenal Incorporated imported was the SLR 101. Essentially this was an SLR 95 made compliant with the new rules after 1998. So it was a single stack thumb hole stock gun. It was imported with or without a muzzle brake, this style here. I didn't mention earlier, apologies. The SLR95 could be purchased as the SLR95MB with a muzzle brake as well. There was even a version of the SLR95 called the SLR95L that had a longer 20 inch barrel, just for completeness of sake. But the SLR-101, which was Bulgaria's first gun, was the same. It just took single stack 10 round mags. Still a milled receiver, still based on the AR-M1. But this didn't last long. Soon Arsenal became interested in converting them and doing something similar to what Arsenal USA had gotten into. At first they would take the thumbhole stock off, install a pistol grip, a standard stock, they would open up the mag weld to take standard pre band double stack magazines. And they would add uh, four or five US parts, usually the trigger group, stock set, or pistol grip, various times they would use different ones. They would name this as the SLR 101 SB. B for black. You could have a black stock. They would also do the SLR 101 SG with an olive drab green stock set. And so this was the first pistol gripped version. It's worth noting they did sell it as the SLR 101 SB1 that still only took low capacity magazines for I guess ban states and so on and so forth. But we're still in the ban here so these guns do not have bayonet lugs or removable muzzle devices. After importing for a brief time, Arsenal started to go over to assembling guns in the USA. Again, much like what Gordon Tech had done for Arsenal USA. Rather than bringing over complete functional guns, they would bring over parts kits, complete parts kits with brand new unissued parts and they would bring over 80% receiver forgings. So they were technically not receivers. What they would do, they would get the receivers over, they would machine them out to 100% receivers, they would mark them made USA because they were finished out here, so they will not bear made in Bulgaria or Bulgaria on the receiver, rather they will just say Arsenal Incorporated, Las Vegas, Nevada. 
And that started this whole line here that this gun is going to represent. It was known as the SA Space M7 series. And it began at least by 2002, perhaps 2001. I looked, I'm not sure exactly, but early 2000s still during the assault weapons ban. The introductory guns were the SA M7, which was essentially a US assembled SLR 101 SP with a few different stock options. There was also the SAM7S, which featured a scope rail. And then we would get into the Classics series. They would do the SAM7 Classic, which was a pretty close approximation of the original AK Type 3, rather than having the AR M1 profile barrel lightweight with the 90 degree gas block it would have the the older style same as really on the SA93 and SLR96 with a slightly heavier profile it would also have the sling swivel on the rear of the receiver and they would do the SAS excuse me SAS M7 classic which was the underfolding version here now since this was during the assault weapons ban, the original SAS M7 Classics had their stocks pinned open, but they were the original style that only locked on the one side and they had the spring-loaded butt plate. These guns would soon be joined by the SA RPK-7, but you can guess what that is. It is an RPK built on a milled receiver. So they would basically take the same receiver they would use on the SAM7. They would install a club foot stock, a longer, heavier 23 inch barrel and bipod and wood furniture. And that was another one that was done during the ban. It would have a muzzle nut permanently attached to make it ban compliant. And since RPKs didn't have bayonet lugs, they didn't have to worry about not putting one of those on. Those, uh, the classic ones and the RPK would have wood furniture. The more modern ones like the, the SAM7S and the SAM7 would have the black polymer furniture or your choice if you wanted green. Early on it doesn't seem like they were offering plum, it was either green or black. And they would do NATO or Warsaw length buttstocks. These guns are very well regarded today. The US made ones from back in the day. They have a more durable finish, it's a little shinier than the Bulgarian, it seems to be a little more durable. Whereas the Bulgarian guns were assembled, well, on an assembly line in mass production in Bulgaria, the US ones were put together by hand by gunsmiths. So they just tend to be a little smoother, a little nicer. They have double hook triggers. They're, even the US parts they used were made to original Bulgarian specs and even sometimes were made on Bulgarian tools and dyes. So very, very high quality builds. These early arsenals had a high quality price tag to match. The first ones I recall seeing in person were about 2002-2003 in a friend's store. This was a time when you could get SAR1s and, and what not for 350 new you could get mac 90s used for around 250 maybe 300 arsenals at that day were 550 to 600 which seems cheap by today's standards but back then that was nearly double what a you know a romanian and more than double what a chinese might go for so they were considered pretty pricey and of course this again during still during the ban so they didn't have a lot of the fun features they did, though, at least take high-capacity magazines, which had to be pre-banned. They would usually ship with one 10-rounder, which was modern production. You could go buy, you know, go buy a pre-banned mag and stick it in here. And that was pretty much what Arsenal did. The SLR 101 imports would dry up. I honestly don't know when they quit bringing them in. I think it was kind of a, a quiet thing when they quit bringing them in, and they transitioned over to their U.S.-made guns. While doing this video research, I was reading some old forum posts from 2002, 2003, and it's funny. Where today we consider these early US made guns to be really the pinnacle of arsenal. 
back then people were questioning the receivers because they weren't Bulgarian. They were saying, well, who's making them? What's the quality? There was uh, worries about rail thickness and so on and so forth. Obviously time has gone by and, and these receivers have held up very well. No one's really complaining. But it's interesting just to look back at where we've come from. Oh, one other model. I apologize. I didn't mention. Arsenal would expand from not just doing the SAM7 line around 2003 to also doing the SAM5 line which was the same gun but in 556 NATO. So there is the SA space M-5. Also there's there was a M-5S with the rail and some other furniture options as as band compliant. Well, that's what they did during the assault weapons ban. It was lifted, or allowed to sun, sunset, I should say, in September, September 19th, 2004. Well, in 2004, Arsenal really led the charge. They thought the ban wasn't going to be renewed, so they already were, were making plans to do ban-free, or post-ban post guns. This is one of their first offerings to come out late that year. This is my SLR 95, excuse me, SLR 105. This was the first stamped receiver gun to be imported from Bulgaria. It was also the first gun to be offered by Arsenal in 545 by 39. Now, looking on their website, they do mention a model called the SLR 102 in 545. Allegedly, it was a thumbhole stock gun milled receiver that took single stack 545 mags. Aside from the single mention on Arsenal's website, there's nowhere to be found. If anyone out there in YouTube land owns one, I'd love to hear about it. I think it was probably something they planned to bring in, only brought in a few samples and then never pursued because 545 was not that popular in the early 2000s. This was long before the surplus ammo hit. And again, Arsenal's are pretty pricey guns. Well, the SLR 105. We have a complete video on this, so I'm just going to kind of skim it. If you're interested, click that, because I thought it was worth its own video. Arsenal announced these right around the time of the assault weapons ban sunset. They were pushing at that time to do stamped receivers to try to lower their cost and be a more competitive company. Century was really starting to bring over the Wasser 10 in large numbers, and they wanted to try to compete with that. These would first come in without threaded muzzles or bayonet lugs, even though it was post assault weapons ban, the 89 import ban was still in effect. They would also first come in without rails. Later, after the SLR 105, they would do the SLR 105A1, which would have an AK-74 front side assembly with bayonet lug and 24 mil threads put on in the USA by Arsenal Incorporated. They would also do the SLR R, or excuse me, SLR 105R with a rail. They would originally call guns with rails, they would add the S suffix. They would change this sometime in 2004, maybe late 2003, from S to R. So from now on, guns with rails will have the R suffix. And they would do this essentially in four versions with and without band features and with and without rail. These guns were supposed to sell for around 450 so significantly cheaper, maybe 400 than a milled. And they were the first 545s to really be available. So people really flocked to them. That said, they did not import very many, perhaps 500, give or take. Now, when Arsenal would sell them, they would have black polymer furniture. I have put Russian wood on this, as you see, but the furniture is the same. That's the only change I've made. It just, uh, instead of being made of uh, wood, it would be black polymer with the grooves and everything, fixed stock and so on and so forth. They would start to sell these in very late 04. They'd sell them for a little while through 2005, and then that seems like that was it. They didn't really bring over too many of the SLR 105s, and they quickly kind of passed into Legend as one of the best guns to come in. 
Unlike the milled guns, these have a single hook trigger. But it's a very nice one, very polished up. They feed from standard double stack AK-74 mags. They brought them in to the country only accepting single stack, low capacity, but Arsenal Incorporated would, um, would open them up and make them take, well they wouldn't really open them up, they were still double stack, but they would install a bullet guide and, and open them up and do what they needed to do to make them take high capacity. They would finally have a cleaning rod under the barrel, thank goodness, I just think AKs look weird without cleaning rods. And that would really start Arsenal kind of on a new course. And it all began with this rifle here. So after introducing the SLR-105, it's really kind of a test gun. What they did is they went away from the milled receiver. They had already stopped importing complete milled guns, and they were getting away from the U.S. assembled milled guns from kits. They claimed that the cost was um, just exorbitant. And if you go back and look, if that era guys were saying oh they we love the arsenals but we don't like the uh the cost so i kind of understand their attempt to uh, to lower the cost the guns are starting to climb into the seven eight hundred dollar range by oh five so i get why they're doing it when they're trying to get the the stamped guns in a little cheaper so they began to talk about doing a new series of stamped imports. We're, we're away again from the US made mill guns. We're going to import it stamped. And this had several members. There were two main families. There was the SLR 107 family, which was in 7.6239. .6 there was also the SLR LR106 family in 5.56. Arsenal started to talk about doing more stamped guns in late 04 and through 05. I honestly don't remember at the time seeing them on the market in 05, but I know they were available by 06. If they came in in 05, it was, um, it was pretty late. But I think by the time they got to market, it was uh, 2006. Now, what we have here, just as an example, this is an SLR 106F. This is in 5.56 as stated. It's a Bulgarian import. This is essentially an AK-74, but in the NATO caliber. These come in with thumb hole stocks. They do not have a bullet guide, so they can't feed from standard mags. They have to take low cap when imported. What they would do for the lugs, accessory, bayonet, they would not machine them out fully in Bulgaria. So once over in the USA, Arsenal Incorporated could machine them out with a quick tool and then have working lugs. They would also be imported with a muzzle nut tack welded onto the 24 millimeter threads. Once in the USA, obviously they would be converted. This is removable. It's a US made AK-74 style brake. Some will be chrome lined, others will not, depending on the exact model. Standard polymer hand guards for a stamped receiver. We have a side folding buttstock. This one's new, so it's going to be stiff, guys. There we go. See? Obviously, this was something installed in the USA. Although the trunnion and all that was installed in Bulgaria. The F models, which were obviously in both families, 106 and 107, do not have the side scope rail, much like the SLR 105. There was also an FR that had a rail, which is honestly probably more common. You don't see a lot of just the straight F models. It's worth noting, and we pointed this out in the 105 video, Arsenal was planning to do a side folding version like this in the 545 gun, doing like a 105F. It didn't materialize, at least not for a long time. They were also talking at the same time about doing a full size gun in 7.6239 and SLR 107 with a fixed stock which didn't materialize back in 2004-2005.
it, it too would wait quite a long time. We'll get into that here in a little while. So this was the standard full size. These were about, well, they, they never got them to market as cheap as they'd hoped. I can tell you that. They, these were always still pretty pricey. They were in the 750 to 800 range, but this was at a time when milled guns were getting close to 1,000. So they were a couple of hundred cheaper. They did offer a side folding stock, and we're going back to a true blue import versus a, a gun assembled from Bulgarian parts in the USA. Another member of the family... was the CR model. Now, they had at one time a C model without rail listed. I don't think it ever actually was brought into production. If it was, it was very small. All of this style with the C, I've seen with the rail. This happens to be a 106 CR. They did a 107 as well. Same rear end, same gas system up to this point. The big difference, we have a combination front sight gas block unit, much like a Russian AK-102, 104, 105. We have a, still a 16-inch barrel, not a 12, but we have this removable fake hider on it. I'm going to point this at you so you can see. Barrel sticks through. This is removable. This has 24 millimeter threads here. No bayonet lug because of being the short version. So the gas system is the same, the difference is in the block here. These do come with the cleaning rod, but it's for the 16 inch barrel. It's too uh, long to fit under here securely. So if you wanna put the cleaning rod in, you need to cut it down or find a shorter one. The 106, 107 CRs sold for a little more. Is it safety on? Nope, it's new. They sold for a little more than the F and FRs. The FRs were the cheapest. The Rs added about 20 bucks. The CRs added about 50 bucks. So still in the same ballpark. These were neat, and actually my very first gun, it wasn't this one here, but my very first stamped arsenal was a 106 CR because up until that point, you didn't see the AK-102 styles, the combo devices. I just thought that was really neat back then. I, uh, I still do. I bought it. In, uh, I'm trying to think, 2000, late 2006, I believe. And the third member of the original family is this model here. This is an SLR 107, so this one's in 76239. UR. This is the, sh well, not shortest exactly, but lightest version. It is based on the AKSU crink. We have the same side folding stock here. Black polymer hand guards, crink style. We have the hinge top cover, uh, flip rear sight, very crinkified. And we have the muzzle nut here on 24 mil threads. And we have a long 16 inch barrel. Now, they would offer a factory SBR version of this here, but it's worth pointing out that every 106, 104, 107 UR that comes into the country has this long barrel. If you get a factory SBR, they cut it down at Arsenal. This is because the 1968 Gun Control Act prohibited the importation of NFA items, Title, title III items, which an SBR would be, for the civilian market for civilian sales. So all guns that come in have to be Title I, basically, if they're gonna be sold on the civilian market. So yeah, factory SBRs are made into SBRs at Arsenal Incorporated, Las Vegas. This was the third member, as I said. These were a little pricier. They sold in the $1,000 to $1,100 range. But again, this is a true factory built crank. And at, the, at that time, it, this was really the only option going. And really to this day, these are the only options going. Originally, these were done in the 106 and 107 family. So they pretty much released all of these at once 2006 in both uh, calibers and in all three class sizes. 
as time went on, would go on, they would continue to do different versions. They would start to do different furniture colors, green, plum, and more, most recently, uh, desert tan. Some, some without rails, most that were sold had rails. They would do band compliant versions for, um, for states, but they would do all folding stocks. They, they didn't do a, a, a fixed version. The only fixed one was the original SLR 105. So all, the, all of these were, were F folders. And this was Arsenal's mainstay for a long time. Summer of 2006, they announced they were discontinuing the SAM-7 US Assembled Series, citing cost concerns and probably just paying gunsmiths to machine them out. I understand it was probably a cost thing, rising cost, and it was a way to control that. They did say they would continue to do a few as special runs, but as standard production, no more. They would kind of keep the SAS Classic, the underfolding classic in production in some very small batches. And I've seen receivers dated through at least 2008. They would even do a version like mine you just saw with uh, Bakelite handguards. Most of them would have wood, but they would do a small run of about three dozen with Bakelite handguards. The SA Classic, the fixed stock, doesn't seem to have been produced in a long time. I have not seen them in stock at uh, Arsenal and any of their distributors. Speaking of distributors, that's another change. Early on, Arsenal Incorporated sold direct to dealers, with really its only major distributor being Lou Horton up in Massachusetts. Around this time, though, when they started to introduce these series, another cost savings measure they tried to do was they stopped selling direct to just small dealers like myself. They started to sell through distributors. So instead of just calling up Arsenal and ordering a gun, as I did with my original SA M5 in late 04, you had to get go through, uh, like it was, who was it back then? Xander's, Ellett Brothers, AccuSport, Davidson's, Luke Horton, and then there was, a, there was about six distributors they had. Please note that back then, 2006, KVAR, though it had existed since around 2000, did not have an FFL. They were exclusively a parts vendor. They were essentially owned by the same folks who owned Arsenal Incorporated, even in the same business block, but they did not sell guns back then. Well, that's the end of part one. We'll have part two coming up. So please tune in to that. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, we'd really appreciate it if you'd do so. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.